Okay. 30 seconds <laughs> of no words, yet for some of you it may have felt like hours of silence. It's almost like we don't know what to do in situations where nothing is happening because the majority of time we're expected to see something or hear something or feel something. While studying classical percussion here at USC, I actually stumbled upon a composition that capitalizes on the awkwardness we all just felt. A piece of music without sound. Titled 433 by John Cage, this piece is composed of three distinct movements made entirely of silence for four minutes and 33 seconds. Until I heard this piece, I truly thought the music was the notes, rhythms, and motifs. I mean, I knew that sound had so much power, but I was unaware that silence did too until I went to Springfest, an annual concert here at USC that um, never fails to make you feel all sorts of emotions. <laughs> Picture it with me, timestamp, um, April 1st, 2017, 8.30 p.m. As I walked into the university quad to see Migos perform, I was engulfed by a cacophony of screaming, high-intensity EDM music, strobe lights, and fights breaking out in front of me. To my left were students laughing and dancing along to the music, while to my right, to my direct right, was a woman crying as she was being pushed and shoved by the crowd. Screaming, sobbing, stressed. In this instance, I did not want to see or hear anything. Four minutes and 33 seconds of silence would have been a godsend here. As I left that night, all I could think about was curling up in my bed with a blanket over my head and sleeping without any stimulation. Solitude, silence, serenity. I'm sure you all have probably experienced a similar instance of complete overstimulation like what I just illustrated. But what does stimulation even mean? A stimulus, whether a pin dropping on hardwood floors or thousands of fans chanting at Amigos concert will trigger responses for neurons, sending signals up to the brain to be processed. The brain then makes sense of our surroundings through this information and labels constant stimuli as less important to save energy for sudden changes, like responding to the automated voice saying changes. Yet with so many stimuli coming our way, we must label many events as useless or less important. Now more than ever, we consume data at an enormous rate, from billboards scattered throughout the streets to perpetual notifications on our phones. Everywhere we look, everything we hear, everyone we talk to, we are consistently processing. The Nielsen Total Audience Report for 2021 shows how Americans spend 10 hours glued to a device, including phones, radios, tablets, and televisions, every single day. We never have silence. So then how do we get away from this constant overstimulation? Great question. Well, in the 1950s, Dr. John Lilly embarked on a journey to find that answer. He attempted to create an environment, or lack of environment, without any external stimulation. Solitude, silence, serenity. Originally a dark tank filled with body temperature salt water for floating in, these creations were known as sensory deprivation tanks, also referred to as REST, or Reduced Environmental Stimulation Therapy. And this therapy finally provided us with an outlet to be alone with our minds. Thoughts, pictures, text, music, laughter, emails, homework, talking, watching, pollutions, crying, stress, bills, chills, Perfect. We now have a means to create a world that will practically deprive us of sights, sounds, and touch. But what good is that? While the list of benefits for any peace seeker entering the void of this tank goes on and on, even after attending just a handful of sessions, there are long-term effects on health for months 
after treatment. Mentally, it also alleviates stress and anxiety while reducing symptoms associated with PTSD and depression. Navy SEALs have also used these tanks to reach a state of ecstasis, an altered mental state leading to increased focus, creativity, and productivity. And through this state, they were able to learn languages within just six weeks. Regardless of the reason for using them, these tanks repeatedly brought consumers one guarantee. Silence. I was able to fully understand the benefit of giving my brain a break when I experienced this silent bliss for myself. The first time floating in a sensory deprivation tank, it took about 15 minutes for me to adjust to the environment. And during that time, I sat there with my hands behind my head, staring directly up, waiting for something to happen. But for the next hour and a half, nothing did. So for part of it, I pretended to be an astronaut, twirling around in space, looking down on Earth. I also imagined floating down a river, slowly, all by myself. Occasionally, some thoughts and memories would pop in my head, previous class exams, family outings from childhood, emails I needed to respond to, and I would just let my mind explore them. The majority of time, though, was spent listening to my breath in silence. I had never taken that much time to do that before. And as I left the tank, the experience did not end. I took a shower, and despite the thousands of showers I had taken before, this time it truly felt like I could feel every drop of water on my body. The lights felt like they were flickering. My eyes adjusted to the brightness again. I felt full. I felt weightless. I felt rejuvenated. I remember looking at the bathroom mirror at myself, and I could not stop smiling. I felt happy. So while this opportunity to lay completely silent in a sensory deprivation tank does exist for all of us, the reality is we simply cannot just go to one of these every time we are stressed out or need a break from the noise. So what are some alternative ways to at least partially deprive our senses? Well, let's start with something simple, silencing our cell phones. Research from UC Irvine shows how it takes around 25 minutes to get back on track after a distraction. Now factor in how the average person gets over 60 notifications on their phone every day, and I'll let you figure out what that means for your productivity levels. Silencing notifications, though, is just one example that I'm sure a lot of you already do. The point is there are so many sights and sounds out there that we cannot control. So why not minimize the ones we have power over? And this can vary from putting on sleep masks at night to wearing noise-canceling headphones to even just sitting in bed, purposefully thinking about nothing. Heck, you could even do what I did and move to a farm for a year just to escape the city. <laughs> so I encourage you all to find your own ways of reducing this unneeded noise. And while it may seem like these are minute changes to your everyday life, all of this ultimately leads to that goal of giving our brains a break. And that break leading to mind and body rejuvenation. Besides this ability to explore the conscious mind on a deeper level while healing the body, this strive for sensory deprivation is also allowing all of us to react to a global problem. Desensitization. Desensitization happens when we adapt to a stimulus. Take ice cream, for example. If you haven't had ice cream in a while, that first bite is magical. The sweet, soft, milky scoop resting on that spoon is like pure bliss. As you continue eating the ice cream, though, bite after bite, it seems to become less and less sublime. Our taste buds have adapted. But if you take a break and then eat ice cream again, say, the next day, the magical delicacy in the first bite returns. Regardless of what method we choose, from sleep masks to deprivation tanks, 
we have to find additional ways to silence our senses. Because right now we are in a growing digital age in which content is continuous and silence is seldom. So perhaps we could use the ice cream principle. Perhaps after depriving ourselves of our senses temporarily, we then fully embrace the stimulus in front of us due to the stark contrast of having no stimulation at all. Combating this desensitization could also help us with this lack of urgency surrounding some of the most challenging and often catastrophic ongoing events around the world. Environmentalists are questioning how we can sit on the sidelines as we watch thousands of acres of the Amazon burn while it causes soil erosion, greenhouse gas emissions, and flooding. Students cannot understand how shooting after shooting takes place around the nation, in high schools, movie theaters, and on the streets without change occurring. Community advocates are trying to process how we can walk down the street here in LA, and on our way down to Salt and Straw to go get some ice cream, we pass by dozens of people facing houselessness without even acknowledging their existence. Maybe, maybe part of the problem is we simply cannot feel anymore. We are numb. What was once a novel, drastic issue a couple of years ago, even just a couple of weeks ago, has now become embedded into our daily morning news briefing. We no longer label these instances as dangerous or horrific, but why? Because every day is a wildfire, a catastrophe, and a shooting. Every day we are essentially exposed to an infinite feed of content. Just look at social media alone, where we are flicking through dozens of pictures and videos a minute. One post showing a wedding photo, the next showing the Australian wildfires, and the next reminiscing about a Migos concert from last night. But do we even empathize with these events anymore? Or do we just mindlessly like a picture, comment a heart emoji, and move on with our day? Immense amounts of content covering both surface level interactions and real worldwide catastrophes are combined and intertwined into this simple interface, resulting in atrocities being boiled down to a like, a post, and a share. And this constant noise in media, in conversation, and on our phones forces us to adapt to these events, and we become desensitized to the constant stream of problems that this world faces. Our brains are drowning in information, and they are gasping for air. Sensory deprivation is far from the solution to all of the issues that this world faces. But it can help us in at least deciding what is relevant, because as of now, everything and nothing is important. And we are so overwhelmed with everything coming our way that we are doing nothing. And in a time where problems are so readily available, isn't doing something no matter how small, all that we can ask for. So, how do we learn to feel again? How do we empathize if we can't even process the severity of what is going on? I'd like to remind you how this speech started. 30 seconds. And I bet a lot of you felt something there. We need a baseline, a refresh, a break. We need to step away from the ice cream for a while. We need solitude. We need silence. We need serenity. In order to feel something again, we must first feel nothing. Thank you.